All right, what's up, everybody? This is A7X Fan Ben, and this is Pirate CSG podcast number 68. I'm very happy to welcome the latest guest, which is Vulcan. How are you? I'm doing all right. How are you? Awesome. So how did you get into uh, Pirate CSG? Uh, I would almost say like everyone else, just finding it on the store and realizing what it was and enjoying the crap out of it. Nice. <laughs> Do you know what your, your first... Was actually... Do you know what your first expansion I'm was? Sorry. Oh, it, I believe it was either C, Spanish Main or uh, Revolution. Okay, nice. I can't, I can't quite remember. It's been so long. Yeah, no worries. So how did you get started making ships via 3D printing and decaling? Uh, well, a long time ago, when I was, you know, very little, I had always had an interest in making ships of my own, but I never really had the tools that I needed in order to do so. So when I really started getting back into the hobby, uh, as an adult, I, I realized that you know, I at that point actually did have the tools that I needed to make my own ships, and I just needed to, you know, use my 3D printer and then, you know, get some decals and start doing stuff like that. The only real piece of equipment I had to buy just for making pirate ships was my my cry cut. Because I had everything else already. Nice. Love it. Yeah, so you already had you already had the equipment and I know you had some of the knowledge and stuff too from using Inventor or some of the, the CAD programs and whatnot. Yeah, when I was in school that was one of the things I learned in uh the uh project lead the way classes was uh how to use things like Inventor and, you know, all those various programs, which helped me out a lot when transitioning over to Fusion 360, which, I mean, I'm just going to tell you this, it's, there's very little difference. Okay, nice. Nice. Yeah, I still want to tip my toe into the CAD, the CAD pool, <laughs> so to speak, but. Yeah, it's definitely a lot of new stuff to learn. So, um, which uh, 3D it's not printer quite is hard? Oh, which 3D printer do I have? Yeah. Uh, when I was making ships, I was using a Sidewinder X1. Yep. Uh, unfortunately, that. I'm no longer, well, unfortunately for that printer, I'm no longer using it as my main printer. Okay, nice. Yeah, I had recently, again, funnily enough, recently gotten a Bamboo Labs A1. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's the one I have. I love it. I I love it too. And yeah. uh, the only thing that I've know, that I've thought about when if I were to go back to making ships, uh, with it would be the textured build plate. Might be something that I would have to swap out, but Yeah. Yeah, I got I bought the made sure to get the smooth plate separately. Because yeah, it comes with the texture, but it doesn't really I, I don't think I've even tried decaling a ship that has the textured hull. Or well, or pieces. I don't. I don't think it would stick as well. So, so yeah, I got the smooth plate, which has been really good for me. So yeah, I would. I wouldn't think it'd stick as well either. And yeah. if I were just to use it, I would just have it be on the inside. Yeah, exactly. But... Yeah. And then there's parts that need decals on both sides, so it's tough to tough to know if it would be yeah, good. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it, it's just that it has a smooth plate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which uh, filament do you use? Do you have any favorites? Uh, Overture. Overture filament is what I primarily use. Okay. Unless I, there's just something with the material that I need from any other brand, and then, you know, I'll, you know, snag that. But, you know, usually if it's like PLA or PETG, it's, it's usually Overture. Yeah. Okay, nice. Yeah, I've liked, uh, I used Overture recently. I found it kind of almost like more stiff um than other filaments like once the parts are printed it was kind of interesting i don't know i thought it was yeah it was just like stiffer like it didn't feel as good to work with but it still works fine um i've liked hashbox uh creality ender and bamboo recently i just i just put in a new uh sun lu for the first time i'm using sun lu in my my ender 3v2 and it seems good so far um only a couple of prints in, but it, it seems good. I mean, most of them are good and will work fine. So, and that's another thing I like about the the A one is so far whenever I put different filaments in the A one, it doesn't seem to matter much. Like it still it prints good pretty much no matter what filament is in there, which is really nice. So, yeah, and my A one is pretty much the same way. You know, I put in, you know, I've only printed PETG and PLA with it so far, but prints them both really nice. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I'm super happy that Bamboo Labs has, like, totally changed the game with 3D printing. I got so sick of troubleshooting the Ender 3 V2. The A1, if, if, any, if anything, I wish I bought the A1 sooner. I only just got it this past May, but... I actually hesitated too long on it, <laughs> but now it's totally, it's totally made my life easier and increases production. And uh, it's just, it's so worth it just from like not having to troubleshoot and tinker all the time, which is the case for a lot of the cheaper ones and the Ender, Ender threes and whatnot. So yeah, and you know what's weird? I spent about the same amount of money on my Sidewinder X one. And I still had a troubleshoot and tinker with it. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, it really tells you the value of the A1. Yeah. Yeah, Bamboo has got some amazing stuff going on, for sure. So, yeah, I got the AMS in uh, June. I still got to try multicolored islands. That's going to be a fun little project for September, I think, hopefully. So that that well, that will be amazing. That yeah. will absolutely be do. Yeah. You can make like those to... islands and more like those islands that you occasionally will see on eBay, those hard plastic islands from those box sets. Yeah. Yeah, Gale Can't quite Nine remember what they were. Yeah, Gale yeah. Force Islands. They're pretty good. Yep. Yeah. Um Yeah, you could do all sorts of stuff with that yeah 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 the tough part is getting the not having as much like poop like waste filament because every time it changes color it, it it like pumps out extra um there's ways that i've found like some guides on like ways to decrease that and minimize it um so just have to work on that and maybe making like each layer not each layer different color but like on the island have basically not having different colors on one layer might be one way to minimize the waste basically so i'll have to play around with that like have a bottom like five layers or ten layers are like sandy brown and then like green above that and then like gray for like a small mountain or something on the, the, the top layers or something maybe might play around with that kind of that kind of thing but we'll see uh, i think it would be i think it'd be good to go over like the basics of optimal settings i know this is like where you really helped me a lot um, and your advice came in really handy earlier this year, especially um, on like some of the settings and just some of the general knowledge about how to optimize prints, which it applies to ships especially, but I mean, it's, it's good 
3D printing knowledge in general. So just in case anybody's listening that uh, that is trying to 3D print their own ships, or you know they don't they don't have <laughs> a bamboo printer, or they have like you know they have a starter printer, and they're still messing around with stuff and trying to get stuff to work. Um, so I wrote down some of them that we can go over, like initial layer height, increasing that so that it's bigger than the average layer height. So right now in, in Cura, my default profile for ships is having the initial layer height of 0.3 millimeters and then a, a layer height of 0.175 after that for the other four, if it's five layers for a one millimeter thickness ship, which I know you printed ships at different heights, I think like 0.9 mm. I still got to try that actually. Yeah, the uh, the files I believe for my ships were zero point nine, but I would always extend them up to one millimeter, and uh, when I sliced them. Okay. And the, the go to that I went with it was a uh, zero point four millimeter layer height for the initial layer, and then zero point three for the two other layers because I had a 0 0.6 millimeter nozzle. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I got the 0 0.4 nozzle. Uh, yeah, I should have said that, yeah. Yeah, it definitely helps with your speed too because then you can print a ship in three layers versus, for me, it's five, so nice. Mm -hmm. And then another one. Yeah, and... Yeah, you go ahead. It, it also does help with, like, layer adhesion. You know, especially if you can get as much squish down with uh, that first layer as you can without getting too much elephant foot. Yep, exactly. Yeah, and that kind of leads into the next one, which uh, 125% initial layer line width is another good one. So then it, it lays down a fatter line <laughs> for the first layer, which is good for adhesion and having the, the lines stick to each other. Cause I was having some problems earlier this year, at least like January, February with uh, the lines came out thin, like kind of thin and stringy. Even when they would stick, sometimes they wouldn't touch or they would touch for part of the bed and then it would get to the other side of the bed and they wouldn't, the lines wouldn't be touching when they should be. So so the increasing the initial layer line with 125% is another good one. Um, Wall ordering outside to inside, that's another one that helped me a little bit. Um, again, these are like Cura slicer settings for anyone uh, interested in printing stuff and printing ships and whatnot. Uh, another one, I'm just gonna go through some of the ones that have worked for me at least. Another one I like is bottom pattern initial layer concentric. So it prints in like concentric rings rather than lines and whatnot. That one, I don't think that one helped a lot, but um, just there's all these little tweaks that you can make over time where like the print might only get better by like one or five percent but then if once you get experience and like stack all these little tweaks eventually the prints start looking pretty good another one i have enabled is monotonic top bottom order um for ships i enable ironing so that the top layer is nice and smooth that's mostly for the decals because the smoother the the part the better the decal will adhere and stay on there. Um, for ironing, I do concentric pattern. Um, I've had a, the experience with ironing pattern of lines worked fine too, but I think I kind of settled on concentric as being my preferred pattern. Uh, just for me, it works good with the V2 for me. Um, and then one of the biggest tips that you gave me was jacking up the, the initial layer nozzle temperature. Cause I was at like 205, I think in January maybe or last year. And then you talked about just going straight to 230 and then 220 after the initial layer. And that made like an immediate improvement for me. So thank you for that tip. Cause that really, that probably sped up my process by like one to two weeks of, of troubleshooting back then. So. Yeah, the hotter that material comes out, the more, well, sticky it's gonna be though. So. That's that. That's the main reason why that and the twit I usually print 
Um, a lot of manufacturers and a lot of people say, interestingly enough, that you should try to get as low as you possibly can with your nozzle temperature because to, in order to avoid stringing. But with what we're doing with making ships, stringing isn't really going to be the biggest thing we're going to have to worry about. It's getting that ship to stick to the build plate. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, the first layer of adhesion is more important. So Especially because we're printing stuff that's basically flat. It's almost two dimensional, so we don't we're not doing like towers that have like spires and we don't we don't have much height at all for our stuff, so mm -hmm. yeah, it's a pretty specific application of it. So and then another one I have enabled is uh retraction with combing mode all. Um I don't know if that helped a lot, but that was another tweak I made at some point back in like late winter or early spring, I think. Um and then I want to get into like some of the, the breakthroughs I had. I had, so those were kind of like some of the best practices, like settings that I typed up um, when I was going through Curious Slicer settings like an hour or two ago. So, but for the breakthroughs, the things that helped me the most with printing ships was one of them was upgrading my build plate. So I never had any good experiences with the glass build plate that comes with the Ender 3 V2, um, but the magnetic PEI build plate upgrade that really helped me a lot um, for adhesion and also for like not having the build plate build up like crap on it. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I just didn't clean it enough when I had a glass build plate, but for some reason the filament would stick on and it was almost impossible to remove um, versus the magnetic PEI build plate. It's like a gold color one that I have on the V2 right now. It's a lot easier to clean and there's, there's not really ever any like permanent buildup because once you get those on the glass build plate, once I got those lines, it wasn't like a full, you know, like 0.3 height or anything. But once you get those lines stuck into the glass build plate, they're really hard to get off, which can be problematic because then it, you keep building up more and more. Um, and then another breakthrough was like tall and wide initial lines, which we kind of talked about with the initial layer height and initial layer line width being larger numbers basically um and then and then the next one is probably for ships i think is the biggest uh whole horizontal expansion which i abbreviate hhe so we both know about this one uh this is like just a game changer so for people that don't know um whole horizontal expansion is like one of the key settings in uh kira in bamboo slicer which we use, or at least I use for the Bamboo Labs A1 printer, it's called uh, Whole Compensation, HC. But um, in Cura, whole horizontal expansion is defined as amount of offset applied to all holes in each layer. Positive values increase the size of the holes, negative values reduce the size of the holes. So this is key because of the slots and the importance of getting really accurate tolerances so that the tabs on hulls and masts will actually fit into the slots the way they should, where it's tight but not too tight. Um, and usually, you know, tighter is better than too tight is better than too loose because if it's too loose and stuff just falls apart, there's no way you can't really fix that. If it's too tight, you can at least widen it with an exacto knife or or whatever. Uh, it's still really annoying though, especially because once the plastic is hardened, you know, it's not. It's just hard plastic. It's not easy to work with. Um, but, but yeah, I got a spreadsheet with my different, <laughs> the different ship types, and they, they have different like horizontal expansions and or different whole horizontal expansions. But um, thank you for pointing that out because I know we had some discussions about that <laughs> earlier this year. But whole horizontal expansion was a, was a game changer, and I know you used it for some of the ships as well. Mm. That really helps, you know, get the whole size exactly where you need it to be, especially with how each printer and the material will vary once it's printed because the material itself will expand ever so slightly. So, yeah, but yeah, exactly. Each printer and each filament is going to have its own, like slightly different properties and it might depend on environmentals and 
room temperature and stuff like that. So, and then there are once in a great while I've had like where you keep the HHE the same, the settings are the same, and then the, the result comes out different. Um, usually not too often though. Um, and that's not really a problem on the A1, it's more consistent than the, the Ender 3 V2. Um, but one thing I've noticed with the V2, sometimes without changing settings, a print will get worse even the same day once in a while. Like sometimes, uh, I don't know what the pattern is, but sometimes like my, if I print multiple ships on one build plate, like one, one print job, once in a while, the ships on one edge or one side of the build plate will have tighter tolerances than the other one. So it's like this weird game where I know that one of the ships is just going to come out worse but then I'll just have to like force it through and then the other one will be almost too loose, but then um, it's like just barely good enough to be like a sellable or usable ship. So yeah, tons of troubleshooting and a lot of, a lot of learning and <laughs> figuring it out and testing and retesting and taking notes and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, going back to the other breakthroughs, I'll move on. Um, nozzle temp 230 220 helps. So just jacking up the nozzle temperature. So it's always recommended like 200, 205, but for printing ships, you know, like you like you talked about, we like to go higher. So um, I've got my initial layer speed on the V2 way down to 10 millimeters per second, which is really slow, but that helped me get like first layer adhesion, which was worth it. So especially because once you once you start like a long print job with like multiple ships. Like the the duration of the print doesn't matter that much unless you have to like go somewhere. Um, so sometimes I would just leave prints out and I just have it. I had it going overnight a bunch in like May and June when I was when I was printing ships for the first ten sets of Golden Seas. I was just a lot of times I would just go to bed with it on for like an eight hour print and then I'd wake up and it'd be like just about done. <laughs> so um, and another breakthrough I had was cleaning the bed frequently. Uh, isopropyl alcohol. And then washing it in the sink once in a while, like soap and water. Um, but yeah, the A1 solves almost all these problems because they, you almost don't have to worry about this stuff for the most part. I've only made a few adjustments, I think, in the slicer for ships, mostly to do with hole compensation, which is like the bamboo slicer version of uh, HHE. But I don't know about your A1, but mine is set to like, I think the default print speed is like at least 200 millimeters per second. And I think that's faster on certain elements like the walls. I remember yeah, being. I, 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 yeah. Sorry, I haven't. Yeah, I haven't really tinkered a whole lot with like the speed of it. You know, I've just been selecting profiles for what I've been doing, but I haven't been printing ships either. So. Yeah. Yeah, I remember the first print on the A1 was like a Benchy test or whatever that I ran. And I was like shocked by the speed. Like I, I had heard about, you know, it's they're way faster nowadays than the printers made like four or five, six years ago. But I hadn't seen any videos of how fast it was. So when it started, I was almost like, I was almost like worried. I didn't know. I was just shocked. Like the way it, it's like zips around and like, I still, it's, it's crazy to me that they've mastered the technology Bamboo Labs has where the uh the lines go down so fast that it's hard to believe that there's any adhesion like if i tried to go that fast on v2 you just it'd be stringing and like there would be, i don't know it'd just be a disaster it's just crazy to me that they they the lines and the filament can adhere to the last layer as it's just flying through stuff it's just uh, it's just really amazing to me so it's crazy stuff mm -hmm. i'm really glad the technology has come a long way though because it kind of it's kind of due for it, to be honest. It's kind of been like a tinkering hobby for like a decade or two. So it's good to finally get some machines that are affordable and also they just work out of the box. There's not really, there's not a huge troubleshooting aspect. So what do you think is the hardest thing about 3D printing overall? Uh, the hardest thing about 3D printing well, kind of what we were talking about is the tinkering and, and all that other stuff because, you know, setting the printer to print something and letting it go, 
you know, that's not why I'm doing too much there, but, you know, yeah. getting your printer set up to get those prints just right is the hardest part about 3D printing, in my opinion, because you can make stuff on Fusion 360 all day, you know, nothing hard about that whatsoever. You can have your printer running all day, nothing the frustrations and everything else just start to happen when you got to figure out, hey, why isn't my printer doing what doing what I want it to do? And that's why, just like you, I switched to the uh, the Bamboo A1. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and the Sidewinder, actually, I needed the uh, the heat bed for it gave out again and I couldn't find a replacement for it online so oh, wow. so that's yeah so like the A1 at this point is getting old so it was time to go to the printer huh interesting my heat bed gave out what, what is that I don't know I don't think I've had that happen did it break okay so let's just it's not a very accurate way of putting it what ended up, what actually happened is the thermistor, even though it's still somewhat working, the thermistor is giving false readings to the rest of the printer. So it would stay, it would heat up to like the 60 degrees Celsius for the heat. And then when it would start moving around, it would drop down by 20 degrees just on movement alone. And that would cause a print to error out. So the last bit of time that I used it, uh, I had I had to go into the printer and just unplug the thermistor for the the heat, you know, the heat bed. Just so that way it wouldn't error out. Yeah. Wow. It meant I couldn't use the heat bed, which sucks, but you know. Yeah. Could I just couldn't find another one online though for a Sidewinder X1? Like I'm sure if I did enough searching, I could find something that's compatible. But it just seems like all the replacement parts for the Sidewinder X1 that aren't like the extruder head or anything like that are just nowhere to be found anymore. Yeah. Interesting. Um. The next one, I think, is kind of an interesting question for both of us, since we've both made a lot of ships. What do we think is the biggest key to making ships successfully? I'll let you go first, like specific to the pirate ships. Uh, specifically, making ships successfully, for me, it was just making sure that you know, I had that layer adhesion down. Whether it was, you know, applying a little bit of uh, adhesive here and there to make sure that the pieces just, you know, stuck. You know, trying to uh, adjust, you know, like the whole compensation, trying to get that just right. The the big and also what I've done. And what I've been doing all this time is just I've been making a single ship at a time. Wow. So, you know, that, you know, it, it requires more user input, but it also means that if something bad does happen, it's less likely to affect the entire print. Yeah, true. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I there think... Have been Sorry, uh, there have been plenty of times where I had to, uh, you know, either print replacement parts or, you know, make another ship because something bad came out. Yeah, yeah, I got a whole bag full of, uh, like, waste parts and ships that didn't work out right and stuff like that. It's the worst is when you have, it's almost perfect, and then one part of it doesn't work, like, randomly... 
the jet, the gaff mast to, towards the stern is like way too loose. Like you tip the ship upside down and it falls out or whatever, <laughs> like, or the flags or the pennants are all jacked up because they're, they're too small to print effectively, consistently, things like that. Um, yeah, I would always do, whenever I'm testing, including on the A1, like to get the whole compensation dialed in, I always do one ship at a time, but eventually, you know, I was just trying to max it out. <laughs> Um, I even had a few prints where I think my, I think my printer settings in the V2 were slightly off to where I think the, the G code thought my print bed was bigger than it was. So I think I had a few four or five masters. I think I was trying to cram like four or five masters on the bed or something. And then, um, it, it would trigger like almost like an out of bounds error type thing where the the hull at like the north end of the bed or the the y-axis would be cut off basically and it just wouldn't be able to print so it was like the last like three or four millimeters of the deck was cut off so that kind of messed things up for a few prints but um but yeah and then for me i think i think the biggest key for me making it successfully was basically tolerance fit and just getting the ships to construct well um, cause that was a real issue in the like late winter for me. That was, that was pretty much like most of my January and February, 2024 was like trying to get the V2 to behave properly and give me ships that were workable <laughs> and that you could actually use in games without getting annoyed or having them fall apart or, you know, one of the tests I like to do is, can you pick a ship up from any of its masts? when you're trying to like do a move segment or or just to pick it up in general to like move it off the table or when you take it out of play to remove mass or whatever and if any if if you can't do that with even a single mast realistically that mast is too loose so then you know it's back to the drawing board and testing and retesting um so yeah i would i had to keep going back and re-editing files and sometimes there were like specific slots like hhe is good whole horizontal expansion is a great thing to adjust up to a point but the problem becomes when certain holes need more adjustment than others and that was one thing that really cost me a lot of time was getting back into the svg files and converting them to stl and tinkercad and whatnot and having each slot be the proper size even if they start the same size or the same like width um the printer doesn't necessarily you know reflect that in the final result so then i would have to go back in and edit like only the four castle you know four mast slot on a five master that needs to be bigger but all the other ones stay the same so <laughs> so stuff like that and then after that i would say the biggest key to making ships successfully once you get the three print jobs good and the ships are good is getting the decals to line up right and to be the perfect size i actually have had more problems with that than I expected. Um, I think part of it is because I, I used the wrong setting in Cura for a while. Um, I used horizontal expansion instead of whole horizontal expansion. So I ended up having some ships that were, all the parts were a tiny bit too small. <laughs> um, this is specifically a problem with the Golden Seas forts. Because um, to get the, the fort stuff to fit together, to slide together right, because those are like a slide fit instead of a like mass into a slot fit it's not just holes it's more like a slide and uh so i had the horizontal expansion like way down to like negative let me look it up i had it down to like negative 0.32 uh, but that was on horizontal expansion so i had to like shrink the port decals in my silhouette uh cutting software so that was that's been a nightmare honestly and then beyond that is if you the other problem I've had is using the same SVGs that I use for the ships to 3D print them uh, or to make STLs with them, it's not good to use those same shapes for the decals because you're not there's no margin of error. So I like to oversize my my holes in the in the decal files now. So that way if the decal doesn't go on perfect or if there's like slight you know human error because you're applying the decals by hand and or if the files just have anything wrong with them at least you have like a, a margin of error so that the the slots or the mask can still go through the holes 
without any overlap or pinching because the, the decal pinching is a nightmare. Um, I actually cut off the, the tab parts of like ship hulls for decals because it's too hard to get um, the sizing right. Because I'd either have to widen all those slots in all the ship like hull parts, which would be really annoying, or, um, or basically just cut the tabs off, which is what I did in the decal files. So, so I would say like early on, the biggest key for me was getting them constructible and getting tolerances to fit. And then after that, it would be the decal sizing and minimizing decal pinching and overlap. So it's kind of a constant learning curve because each ship type is different too. Like on the three-masted long ship, there's this weird thing where the deck goes over the keel, like the middle part. But when it does that, um, it's really tight towards the stern. So I, um, I wasted a whole three-masted long ship and like a few hours of testing because I, I didn't realize that the, the deck would overlap the keel towards the stern, which when you add the thickness of the decals, it, it basically causes the pinching and then you can't get the deck down properly without like ruining the decals pretty much. Um, it's never a good feeling when you have, you have good tolerances on the, uh, on the ship to put it together, but then you add the decals and then that adds thickness, which complicates things because then it might be too tight. So that's just, it's really tough. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's why I, you know, I didn't even bother with trying to get them to, you know, like, unless they were the sliding bits on ships, I didn't even bother with, you know, trying to shove a, a decal on a slot or anything. You know, I did what you did and just cut the decal off where the tabs were, just so that way it would only be the plastic on the plastic. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think the toughest you part... You actually went a step... Say what now? Oh, yeah, sorry. I was going to say, is like, you want a step further and actually change that in the actual decal files that you use. I would just take a hobby knife post print, and once I got it on there and aligned, I just slice off that decal while it was on the part. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not a fan of, like, post-processing. I try to, like, minimize how much, like, work I have to do after the 3d print is done and after the decals are like printed out and laminated i don't like trying to mess with each ship individually part of that is because i knew i was going to be making a lot of ships so <laughs> for each one if i had to actually like physically cut the decals i don't think golden seas would be out yet <laughs> i think i'd still be doing that yeah so it is annoying the file edits are seem nearly endless but once you get it right you can mostly trust that it'll work sometimes it's still tricky but um especially because sometimes the prints now that i have two 3d printers sometimes they produce slightly different results it's a slightly maddening effect once in a while but mostly it's mostly good now so um how did you make new ship types assuming fusion 360 uh, yeah so, like, my process for making a new ship type, that was, like, most of my ship types are based off of other ship types, so, like, the first real custom ships that I made were, like, the four mass, or four segment, anyway, uh, submarine, five segment submarine, uh, that was all just, you know, like, a little, some sketching done in Fusion 360. You know, like I would take the existing, once I had, you know, the designs for the existing three mast or three segment submarines, I just like take it, enlarge it a little bit, and then add some more holes or whatever I wanted to do with it uh, to make it either a three or four or five, whatever segment. Uh, but with some of the more other stuff, like the 10 mast uh, long ship, uh, I kind of had to sketch that out on a piece of paper just to see how I wanted it to look. 
So, and then I would go into Fusion and start, you know, making the ships, you know, making the pieces, you know, paying close attention to how WizKids did their, like, three mast long ships just to get a good reference. And then I'd add my own, you know, my own stuff to it, like additional decks on the 10 mast or, you know, 10 mast long ship. You know, that, that's something that I actually, you know, did is those pieces would slide on and then you would put the masks on them. Nice. Uh, have you seen my my ten mask? My uh, sorry, my ten mask long trip. Yeah, yeah, I remember the pictures in the Discord from a while back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, those. I still regard that as one of my one of the coolest ships I ever made. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty wild. Well. <laughs> I imagine you had to do a lot of testing of, uh, you know, making sure the hull curvature would be fine and getting the decks to fit together. Um, I don't know if you have, well, I, uh, I did take, yeah, I, I got a tiny bit of experience with Fusion back in, I think it's February, um, as part of like a, like a Coursera class. They do have that like assembly option. I don't remember what it's called, but it's like you can join things together and whatnot. I don't know if you use that to help like, visually see the ship coming together or if you just print it out and built it physically to test it i i would just have a gut instinct as to what would go right or what not but what if my technique for like getting curvature down would be to get measurements of like the average so like the middle arc of what that piece would do when it's bent, then I would take a, a spline fine of the same dimensions and then just kind of guess where it was going to go. So, or, and sometimes I do that backwards too. So like, if I'm working strictly from the shape of a deck, what I would do is I would you know, put the holes down, and then I would basically run a line through where all those holes would line up to, you know, in theory, predict where or how that the whole piece would curve and all that stuff. I'd get the measurements that I would need from that, and then I would sketch it, you know, in Fusion 360 based off those measurements from within the actual program itself. Uh, some of it was, you know, guesswork. Some of it was, oh, this piece is a little too long here, so I'll shorten it a little bit. But, you know, I didn't have, I never really had too much trouble with my method. Nice. You know, so, yeah. And, it, it can be a little tedious, especially if you're working with something that's completely brand new. But, you know, it's... Like, I have a very good sense of... Uh, I don't, I wouldn't call it imagination, but just being able to picture what it's going to look like and how it's going to work when I sketch it out. Because I can almost, like, see it assembled in my mind, if you will. Yeah. So... That helps me out with making new ships and stuff. Because I can just kind of picture how it's going to go together and then, you know, design around that. Uh, you might have seen the, uh, oh, uh, the ironclads that I've made. A lot of that stuff, you know, a little less extreme, but still you know, a good a good example of some of that stuff that I come up with to make custom ships. You know, because like you know, like I was saying earlier, making the submarines, you know, that's just like, oh, I'll just take the existing one and make it bigger. You know, but like making things like the Leviathan 
seven mast, ironclad. Uh, that would just, you know, that required like a lot of planning and, you know, just like how how do I want this to look and you know all all sorts of other stuff. But yeah, they they've all come out looking pretty good in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. The uh as as more of an example for kind of thinking about how I want things to go together, uh a, a really good example would be the Confederate ironclad, the uh the Virginia model. You might have seen that on the Discord at some mm -hmm. point. Nice. So like yeah, the the you know that that Virginia model is uh it's still completely one hundred percent flat pieces. There's no, you know, like full fledged three D printed parts there. So I, I guess another way of saying it is that if Whiz Kids wanted to make it with their way of making ships, you know, they could. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely and that's, I, that's I, what I stick to. Yeah, that's an ideal way to design too, because then it's you want your anything to be product like producible with different production methods to maintain compatibility for the future and whatnot. So, yeah, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ideally everything so... is starts flat and is punchable out of a card, whether or not that's how the model first is constructed but but yeah it's a good way to design mm -hmm. yeah, that's, really cool. that's what i'm always yeah i'm sorry uh that's what i'm always thinking of you know is not just multiple production methods but also it's like how would it actually be if it were a legitimate set like if i were punching it out of a card you know how would that work yeah. So. Yeah. Nice. What were you gonna say? No, I just think it's really cool, like the different some of the different stuff you've done and and whatnot. It's something I'd hope to get into a bit in the future once I get some of my other tasks done. But um, yeah, really cool to hear about that process and kind of your thought process on how it works and how they all come together. So really neat. Um. Yeah, thanks again for your help on Golden Seas, because that, like I said, some of those some of those troubleshooting tips, like the, the temperature increase and then the whole horizontal expansion, that probably saved me at least like two weeks total of like troubleshooting and testing. So, which is a headache off my back. So, <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad somebody had already done you know very similar or almost the same exact stuff um, as that as what I've been doing this year. So. And I'm happy to help, you know, if I'm not making ships, I want to make sure that, you know, whoever else is doing it is doing it, at, you know, even better than I ever did, you know, because I, I just, I, I stopped making ships because I just mentally couldn't do it. But that doesn't mean that I don't want ships being made. It, it very much is the contrary. I want, you know, I, if I could still mentally do it, I would just be sitting down making ships more. But, you know, the problem with me is that I had done it for so long that I had gotten very burnt out with it. So, you know, just making physical ship designs right now, or, you know, making those physical ships right now is just not something that I could mentally do. But I still want to see that stuff get out there. So, you know, that's why I started putting all my custom stuff on Etsy, you know, all my custom designs and stuff, because I very much want people to continue making their own ships because if anything that's the next step or a next you know evolution hobby is moving on from what whiz kids did and just taking the reins for ourselves yep yeah, exactly exactly yeah i've done um i i know what you mean about like essentially burnout because i was and that's why i'm pivoting production methods because yeah making 
um, the initial 10 sets of Golden Seas, it, it totaled like 320 ships or forts. And then the real nightmare is even after the printed, at least when the 3D prints are going on, I can, you know, I can do other stuff. I can work on all the, the product page and all sorts of other stuff um, and getting the decal files right while the 3D prints are going. But the decaling is just so time consuming. Um, it's just totally unsustainable. Uh, unless unless you could sell the sets for like a crazy price, it's just too it's just too time consuming to decal every ship by hand. So I know what you mean about getting sick of it because I I have too. So <laughs> yeah, it's a it's kind of a wild. It's an interesting way to go about it. It's definitely the best way to get started for cheap, especially because your startup costs can be quite low. Um, but of course, the time investment will be gigantic. Uh, as it has been for me this year, so yeah. Um, actually, in a way, it's it's almost. Oh, sorry, I keep interrupting you. No, I was done. You're good. Oh uh, well, you know, in a way, it's making your own ships with a three D printer is perfect for just that, making your own ships. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, when you start trying to make everyone else's ships is when you start running into problems. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's too slow and time-consuming overall. Um, but, yeah, I saw this thing that's what, today. That's what I'm... Oh. Yeah, you go ahead. What'd you see? Yeah. Sorry, no, I was just going to talk about something else. Yeah, I saw this article today about um, how AI might help replace some of the 3D printer settings, which hopefully would lead to less less troubleshooting and tinkering. So that kind of caught my eye. Is <laughs> I'm glad the hobby is moving on from some of the time-consuming, you know, headaches. Basically, is what it is, um, and towards a a time where you just hit print and you get what you want, basically. So. I don't know. I knew there was going to be some troubleshooting with the V2 when I bought it, but um, I'm really glad to have the A1. So I'm, I'm the type of person, I'm not the biggest tinkerer. I kind of, I prefer to just, you know, I want the machine to work for me. Cause then, and then while it's printing, then I'm doing, you know, the decals and making new artwork and the marketing and updating my website. And like, there's so many other things I need to do anyway, where I can't really, I don't really have the time to just troubleshoot for like three hours a day. So, um, so hopefully the AI will be able to help a little bit too. Um, it'll be pretty funny if that gets embedded in the, in the software, or the firmware and stuff like that. It's yeah. And anything really that can help get a 3d print to be perfect would probably be welcome addition yeah yeah exactly yeah because i know that's what hobbyists around the world are trying to chase is that perfect print yep yep any other uh topics you wanted to go over whether it's about 3d printing or pirates in general uh i'll start with talking about the golden seas and just how uh how you've managed to deal with it and stuff because that's what i'm really interested in is uh you know like i've made ships you know i know how it is i kind of want to know more about how it was for you designing all those well i think digi is the one that did all the art for him right gg did art did for eventually i think it, i think it ended up being like 17 out of the 28 ships and then i did the other 11 and the the four forts so yeah he was instrumental in not wow. just the the artwork to start like he did he did his art before i did any of mine basically and then i finished it up in like april may june um for the artwork at least so yeah but he was also instrumental with like the files because then i would build I did the whole Spanish faction, so but I built that off of his Illustrator files because there's no reason to like reinvent the wheel, you know, so to speak. Um, so his files were really important in, in getting that going and whatnot, and kind of providing like a general layout and whatnot for how things were organized and, and things like that. So 
yeah it's been it's been yeah. a trip this year and... <laughs> it's been a crazy journey it's like this sh the sheer volume of software i've had to learn from like starting in cura and then going to like a tiny bit of like fusion and then um tinkercad and then adobe illustrator for the artwork and now i'm pivoting to inkscape uh, as a free solution because i want like my templates and whatnot to be free to use i don't really want to like a, i don't want to paywall um you know as a barrier to entry because i think the artwork i've mm -hmm. talked about this on the discord a little bit like to me the artwork solution is one of the biggest barriers to entry for custom creation also for people finishing their custom sets or even getting started really so um and the artwork thing is something i think is is hard to charge for um and i think these templates hopefully will help people get going they do take forever so it's like a really long process to release them but um but yeah it's 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 intense but mostly a fun process um i think the only the only like downer about it usually is like when there's edits that you don't expect or you don't want so like one thing i'm dealing with right now is pivoting production methods where i'm going from 3d printing and decals to a totally different production method with like laser cutting and sheet printing um in in which case i've had to like retool some of the files the ship files we already had um so we're good on those because like they were built um from the ground up to be like card compatible because gino's got like a laser cutter and stuff but um but the crew like i actually just this past evening i or this morning i finished up converting the golden seas crew cards to laser cut because when i first designed them i did all the crew cards and art and all that stuff um or at least put the artwork in there and like design like the the layout because i knew it was going to be like single-sided decal like uh credit card size decals um but then this past night it didn't take forever but i'd spend hours to convert them to like full card like front and back um like laser cut compatible uh files so i think that's one of the things that mm -hmm. i've had to come to terms with over the past few months is like the file editing is it, it's never going to end because even if you get all the files perfect for a set there's always more templates there's always more editing to do and then as soon as you think about a new ship type or creating new artwork you know for new customs you know you're right back to getting deep into the, the software so it's just kind of a constant learning experience yeah, yeah. And that's it's actually where i really love to help you out with anything else that you'd want to do because like the biggest thing when we were really getting in the planning phases of the golden sea set that i really contributed for those who may not know uh was all the alternate ship designs that I had come up with in the event that we weren't at any luxury to use uh, designs that were based off of what we the kids need. And all that stuff, you know, even though I made it in Fusion 360 as like solid 3D objects, at that time, I very easily could convert them into SVGs, which could then be, you know, laser cut. I'll have to explore if I can still do that because the application for doing for exporting them out as SVGs is outdated now. So I'll have to see about getting that downloaded and updated. But the uh, that totally be something I'd love to help you out with in terms of you know new designs or anything like that. Would we'll just be coming up with stuff. Now I'm a little bummed. I'll be honest that we didn't go with the more, you know, historically accurate and or historically influenced designs, but I think it's probably better for familiarity anyway, that we keep things as close to what was considered as possible. Because if it's not, then, you know, people may not recognize what it is. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was probably for simplicity and also, um, like, speed of execution at some point. Um, I don't remember all those discussions in detail, but yeah, I think a lot of your designs will still see the light of day and, and play um, as well. It's just a matter of time and, and whatnot, getting them, yeah, getting 
different file types or getting things finalized. So I think. Yeah, um, and if you if you want to use them, use them. You know. Yeah. Fucking, fucking yeah, I'm really them. excited to actually. I've just been swamped with just existing Golden Sea stuff, so <laughs> it's on my radar. That's for sure. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, also, uh, I when I watched your video on the you know the templates and stuff, it really got my juices up. Going for maybe just making like a, a single, you know, work and not maybe making ships physically, but like doing artwork for them. You know, that would be something that I would, you know, at least right now, be interested in doing. Is, you know going you know making maybe making some artwork for a custom for a couple of ships because you know that was always fun if i yeah i feel like i could probably handle you know doing stuff if i only did a small part of it yeah you know like if you didn't have you know like you having to design print assemble and sell all those ships you know you know, it's if you could only do it was like a small portion of that by yourself, you know, that would make things a lot more enjoyable and obviously a lot more productive too. So yeah. that's something that you know I was thinking. It's like, hey, you know, I could maybe learn Inkscape a little bit because, you know, if that's what Ben wants to transition to, I just I'll learn it myself and. If Ben needs any help, I'll help him, you know, because that's, you know, I, even though I've kind of taken a backseat to the whole, you know, the pirates, uh, the sea, you know, the, the golden sea stuff, you know, I still pretty much wanting to see its success and I still want to help as much as I can. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, because... yeah, the Inkscape partly resulted from, uh, Adobe Illustrator, Gino was Gigi was using that, so then I started using that to like finish the the artwork for Golden Seas, and then since that's a vector editing program, and I already had Inkscape on my computer um, for a tiny bit of Vassal stuff way back in like 2016, um, it was just the most natural program to switch to basically because Inkscape is also a vector. Um, I still haven't. Someday I might play around with some of the raster editors like paint.net and, and whatnot, but um, I think for the most part, I'm going to stick with the vector editing softwares, especially because uh, it's really convenient because the ship shape outlines and cut outlines, both for decals and for uh, laser cutting, are basically vectors, um, like SVG paths for the ship shapes and the card outlines and whatnot. So. Uh, so it's just kind of the most, probably probably the best program to use for it. So and yeah, Inkscape's been pretty good for me so far. Once in a while, it's a tiny bit laggy and there's a tiny bit more glitching than in Illustrator, but it's definitely worth the money saved and the features are are pretty impressive. And I I've barely scratched the surface too. I'm, there's a lot of extensions I I've never even played around with, and I'm sure there's artwork, you know, design elements that I don't even know about yet that I'll hopefully learn about in the coming months. So yeah, it's a pretty good program. So I'm hoping people can find it usable for, for the templates and for artwork editing and whatnot. I don't have a timetable yet on when I'm going to do like the, basically the video about like how I design ship artwork in Inkscape, but I'm tentatively hoping by the end of September, I'll have that video out, but we'll see. It depends on a number of other factors, <laughs> but yeah. So yeah, it's exciting stuff. Uh, yeah, and that's what I would use to make my own ships was uh, Paint.net, but you know that's not vector graphics, and yeah, that's something I had once I realized was a thing. It's something that I, uh, sorry, I immediately wanted to try to eventually do at some point is transition to that because I'm working with pixels, you know, vector graphics. You're working with geometry lines you know all sorts of stuff like that so you know that's more be better for making from either transitioning from small stuff to big stuff or you know 
just making very highly detailed stuff in general because I know that that was something that you were actually taking a small interest in at the very least was you know the uh, epic sets you know those large styrofoam ships that you you know that stuff almost certainly would require having the artwork being done as a a vector graphics instead of something that's just pixels because yeah. my stuff looks good, small, but there's no telling what it's going to look like if it's super big. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, scalability. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it makes sense. So, uh, yeah, I, uh, I encourage you, I will encourage you, if you really want to make your own stuff, uh, take it steps at a time. Do it when you're comfortable because you know there's not i don't want you to feel like you're being rushed or anything to learn how each of these programs because i didn't i certainly didn't learn all these programs overnight i've learned them over the course of my you know my life basically you know inventor i learned in high school paint i learned when i was out of high school you know 3D printing, I learned when I was, you know, you know, in my 20s, around my 20s, I say that very weirdly, because I am 27, but, you know, like, several years ago, I should say, you know, I okay. learned 3D printing, and so, yeah, it's, this has been over, the, my knowledge, I've accumulated over the course of years, and you're having to fucking, you know, take it all down, you know, or, write it all down, take it all in, you know, in a matter of moments, and it can be very overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah, so it's wild. Just, you know, <laughs> yeah, just take your time with it. <laughs> take your time, because that's, that's going to be the best way of approaching that, especially if you want to learn how to make your own stuff. And, and in the meantime, you know, if you want something quick or whatever made, I can help you out. Although, I have also said that to a lot of other people, and I am very horrible of, at getting around and actually doing stuff. Yeah. So. I mean, you've been really helping me really with 3D printing, but yeah, a lot of times the software, it's like, I know I can't learn it all quick enough, so a lot of times I just kind of jump in, and then I just Google stuff, or I search things on YouTube for how to fix stuff, which often... Um, if you just go straight to the source, I can usually find like the solution to my issue or my trying to find the setting I'm trying to adjust or whatever within like a few clicks. So that's usually good. Once in a while I have to watch like multiple YouTube videos about something like clipping and masking is still a tiny bit esoteric to me, but I've mostly got it. Um, yeah, but yeah, usually it's, I think it's quicker. I've heard a few like entrepreneurs talk about this too, where like you don't want to get trapped in like tutorial hell. It's better to just jump in and then like work work on exactly what you're attempting to accomplish. Like for me, it might be like going from like nothing to like a fully designed ship with artwork. And it's like probably 80% or more of Inkscape is not that helpful for that. So then I kind of just go straight to like, okay, this is how the gradients work. And like, this is how I'm going to export the file. And then like, these are the keyboard shortcuts to like draw lines that are like at a 90 degree turn angle. And then, you know, and then I just go from there and search. If I have a problem, I just search what it is and then move on quickly. So, yeah. So I'm not even, it's sometimes it's like maybe the knowledge of the software isn't that deep, but it's good enough for what I want to do. And that's, that's what matters to me to get a result. So. Like even Cura, there's stuff in yeah. Cura that I don't understand, and some of the experimental settings and retraction is still kind of strange to me. But it's like once you get good ships, it's like you know just hit print and pump out the ships, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. You know, and I'm not gonna say I know everything about everything either. So, but like uh, fusion. You know, Fusion 360 is easy enough because you start out with sketches, you know, and then you extrude them into real space. And then that will 
you know, that's funny is that making ships in Fusion 360 is like a very easy thing to do in Fusion <laughs> because you're literally just 2D sketching what you want, extruding it to be whatever thickness you want the material to be, say, if you're 3D printing or whatnot, and then just, you know, cutting the holes, doing any other you know, edits to it, you know, that you need to, because, yeah, that's, that's really the main reason why I use Fusion 360, though, is because I already know Inventor, and also because it, you know, you extrude that into, you know, millimeter or whatnot, and then you got something you can print. It might be flat, but it's still something you can print. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking I'm either going to do like editing nodes in SVG files in Inkscape, probably that combined with a little bit of Tinkercad and or um, I kind of want to learn Blender, but it's a little too much time investment for me right now. So we'll see. As much, you know, what, as I was much considering as I Blender. Yeah, I was considering Fusion 360, but I don't really want to pay for it. <laughs> so there's so many free, free options. I got it. I have it. Well... I, it'd be much, it, it's much more worth it if you're doing multiple different things Yeah. with it. So, like, I have other hobbies that I use, you know, Fusion 364. That's a good point. I, I haven't paid for it yet, so, nice. you know, I, I still have the free stuff, but, you know, I'm, I'm thinking I very well could just get a license for it if I can no longer get the hobby license or whatnot for it because I do use I do use enough of it to warrant you know having the whole thing you know yeah nice but yeah making if you can make ships especially designs for ships for new ships outside of fusion then you know that's probably the better way to go yeah, I use Fusion for things I probably shouldn't use Fusion for. <laughs> yeah, I use it kind of as a substitute for Blender in some cases because I've made like a model of a for example. In Fusion 360, when something like that is probably better for Blender or something. Yeah. Nice. Of course, I'm over here making the physical stuff in, in Fusion 360. And then moving it over to Blender to do the stuff that I know Fusion 360 can't. Okay, interesting. But but yeah, I, I, I'm I'm just like you though. Blender is a pain in the butt to learn. I mean, the newer versions of Blender, you know, infinitely better. But you know, still, it's it's the one thing that I have yet to able to learn successfully myself is you know blender I know enough to do what i want just not anything else yeah nice awesome man any other topics you wanted to cover i think we got most of it uh not necessarily not not that i can immediately think of Nice. Not unless something that comes to your mind that you just want to throw out there. Yeah, I think we I think we covered it pretty much. You got the 3D printing and the various like elements that make it work and things to power through when it's hard and, and then some of the artwork stuff towards the end. So um so yeah, now we can wrap up with uh questions of the day. So I'll let you think you don't have to ask one of course, but um if you want to come up with one while I'm uh kind of coming up with mine. I think my question of the day for the audience, if anybody wants to answer in the comments, is if you do design any digital artwork, which which program do you use, like Inkscape or, or Paint or Paint 3D or whatever, things like that. Um, and then as, a, as another second question of the day, maybe um, do, have you ever 3D printed ships for, for Pirate CSG and how did it go and did you like it or <laughs> did you have troubleshooting issues and whatnot? So, so yeah, if you want to ask one too, 
Uh, oh yeah, I do have one actually. Uh, if you, you know, like, if you want to make your own ship, what do you want it to be? You know, like, if you're making your own custom ship, like, what, what custom ship are you wanting it to be? How, you know, how in depth are you wanting it to be? Yeah, I like that. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, because. You know, is it going to be as crazy as the uh, ten mass long ship, or something as simple as a four segment submarine? Yeah, nice. I like it. Awesome. All right, everybody, feel free to answer the questions in the comments, whether on YouTube or um, in a PM or whatever. But other than that, that wraps up uh, Pirate CSG podcast number sixty-eight. This is a seven X Ben with Vulcan signing off. Thanks for listening, and have a great day.